This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Let us welcome Megan Duquesne. She will tell you a little Thank bit you. more about herself because she can do it better than I can. And do enjoy yourselves. I know I intend to. Thank, Thank you, you, Sue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Megan Duquette. Uh, I've been working at Mission San Juan Capistrano um, almost seven years. I'll be seven in April. I tell the kids that and they, get a, they think I'm seven years old. And I'm, that's not what I mean. <laughs> but um, I, I have the honor of working um, we're with uh, vol volunteers doing docent tours and helping them train them. Um, we also see about 65,000 fourth grade students annually, which is quite a lot. Um, I do a hands-on program specifically about um, different mission jobs during the mission era. Uh, and so I do a hands-on activity where kids can make adobe bricks or rope making. And personally, I've, I see about 15,000 kids a school year doing programming. So I'm a very busy person. I also get to work on exhibit development and museum publications. And one of my, one of my favorite things to do is talk about the mission's history. And, and I'm really, really honored to be here today. So, so thank you, Sue. Um, Let me know when you want the yeah, right now would be really great. Thank you. So Mission San Juan Capistrano, there's a few people that's actually been here. So with a show of hands, who has been here? So we got three people who have been here. And you said about 30 years ago. For you folks, when was the last? It was about that time. OK, well, it's changed quite a bit um, in, in the way it kind of looks today. But um, we'll be talking more about that. Uh, but before we kind of get into the mission's actual history, it's kind of an interesting story um, how colonization basically happened in California. Why did Spain go to that northernmost frontier? And so um, we'll start, start with that. Just the idea of California um, is, is pretty old. Um, in the 1500s, uh, there was a, you know, with just with, uh, excuse me, Christopher Columbus had just come in 1492 or so. And the idea that the New World was some kind of paradise was very popular in Spain. And in fact, there was a, a, a writer by the name of Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo who actually wrote a book about um, this place in the New World, um, an island inhabited by Amazonian women. And um, it was very fantasy-driven, um, very popular of the day. Cortez had read the book. Many people had read this book. And the queen of the Amazonian women, her name was um, Califia. And that's how we got the name California, is because of this Amo Amazonian queen. You see, um, Cortez had come through um, a, you know, in the 1500s, and uh, I would say, I think it was in the 1530s or so, he sent one of his men, um, Jimenez, to go and go to the Pacific coast of what is now Mexico and kind of go up the coast, and he discovered Baja California. At that time, he did not realize that California wasn't an island because he hadn't gone further north to, to realize that at that point. So in many of the earliest maps that you see of California, it appears to be an island like this. And it wasn't really even until the 1700s that that got fixed. They realized that shortly thereafter with more exploration. But um, that, that idea of the island, of um, that, that book, kind of still cons was considered to be. So it wasn't really until 1542 with Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, he was um, sent to go explore uh, further of Jimenez's discovery of uh, Baja California, um, and he went all the way up to Monterey. He missed the San Francisco Bay entry, and it wasn't even until 1775 that a boat actually found the inlet to San Francisco Bay because of the fog, you know, where the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge is. So he came in and he, um, he found San Diego Bay, which he called San Miguel at the time. He went further up, um, and he actually died on the expedition, sadly for him. But um, a few, uh, about 60 years later, they sent Vizcaino to go up. The Manila galleons were kind of going on a, on a um, circular trip from Manila and used the current patterns to come back down. And at that time, there were various pirates, usually English, that were after these um, Spanish ships. And so they were concerned that um, if they bo these boats got in trouble on the way coming past the coast of California, they needed some kind of port. So Vizcaino's job was to find some kind of port that would be possibly helpful in this situation. And um, Vizcaino, when he came through, he 
did the, one of the first maps of the coast of California, and he named um, Monterey and San Diego for what it is today. But it wasn't until 200 years after Vizcaíno came through that Spain had decided to do anything with California. It just kind of sat there. Um, and the King of Spain, King Carlos III, uh, in around the 1760s, was a little bit afraid of what was going on in Alaska with the Russians and the fur trade. And he felt like they were encroaching upon their claims of California and the West Coast um, portions of North America. So they finally decided to do something about it. And they um, got the help of Gaspar de Portola, as well as Father Junipero Serra, which he is kind of our icon of early California. He actually represents uh, the state of California in the statuary hall within the Congress uh, the building. So he's kind of an interesting figure. But I don't know about you. Um, if you were two, these two guys and the only map that you had of where you were going was 200 years old by Vizcayona, don't you think that's a little bit funny and a little bit scary? It's like getting handed Lewis and Clark's map and said, okay, travel across the West. Like, it's, it's kind of a crazy thought. Um, but that's basically what they were given. And um, Hunifer Serra was kind of a, a zealous figure. Um, he, he felt like California um, was unexplored, un uh, these indigenous people were ready to be Christianized, and so he was very excited to be a part of that process. Um, so they headed north, and um, although what they called the sacred expedition to found San Diego, and mind you, at these arrows, this is supposed to be San Diego, and that's supposed to be Monterey Bay. In actuality, it's much different. I'll show you a map in a second. So um, with very little detail to going on, they headed north. Um, they founded San Diego, and um, lots of troubles belayed these people. Um, over 100 men died on the ships going north of scurvy. Um, and uh, Portola, who walked from San Diego to Monterey and coming back, um, many of the men were starving and eating their mules and tallow and what have you. So the, the mission system almost didn't go off if it hadn't been for a supply ship that came in San Diego. Um, and so these Franciscan missionaries, uh, led by uh, Father Sarah, had this giant task of um, using the mission system to colonize California. Uh, and their, their program, why use missions instead of perhaps pueblos or forts? It, the reason being is it was the most cost-effective way of colonizing. Not many people want to go to uh, some place they've never seen before with a map to over 200 years of where they're going. Um, it was kind of more or less the boonies of the entire world. So to get people to go up there was pretty slim pickings. And then secondly, the amount of money required to, to supply these um, farmers, et cetera, was extra, you know, just crazy amount of money. So their, their plan was using mission systems, and um, the Jesuits had just been um, kicked out of the New World um, a few years prior, uh, so the Franciscan fathers were going to be doing this effort led by Father Sarah. And the main goal was uh, that the civil government, the military, would establish forts in San Diego and Monterey, and uh, the Franciscans would deal with the Native American population. The idea was to Hispanicize them, to, um, to teach them the Christian religion, but to make the Native American population into good tax-paying citizens. And how do you do that? Um, and that's, that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. Um, they had a huge task ahead of them, if you think about it. Um, the Native American population in California it was one of the most diverse populations anywhere else in the United States. Um, what I, I found very interesting first coming and learning about the missions, because I, like I said, I'd been a park service ranger dealing more with natural history than history per se. I just found the Native American people of California to be incredibly interesting. Um, just the idea of, of California as a diverse um, place in general, I mean, it has the highest and lowest peak in the continental United States with Mount Whitney being the highest, Death Valley being the lowest. Um, just the native plants, there's one third of California's um, native plants can be found nowhere else on the planet. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things. Um, and the people, the people of, of California have one of the most diverse languages in, um, in the world. 
There's over 100 languages spoken in California before the Spanish came. And uh, of the 100, there's even more dialects. So if you think about it, that's roughly 20% of languages that existed um, of all the, the languages in North America, which is present day Cal or United States, 20% of the languages only existed in the borders of California. It's mind blowing if you think about that. So um, the population before the Spanish arrived was 310,000 people in California, one of the highest uh, densely populated areas north of Mexico at the time. Um, and out of the people here, about 60,000 people lived in the coastal zone, which is where they were going to found these missions. So um, the, the Padres, the Franciscan Padres, had a huge ha task ahead of them, especially on the, lingu the linguistic side, if you think about that. Um, uh, Mission San Juan Capistrano, um, the local people in what is now today Orange County is the Ahashiman people, but the people just to the north and south of us had very different dialects. So if you were a priest and you were bringing in various people from the surrounding areas, we're talking about three different dialects that they were trying to, to either try to, to um, translate or to talk to different people in different languages. So it's very complex. Uh, the, the hard, I think the hardest part is um, for the Franciscans was this enculturation process, or excuse me, acculturation process, where they were basically given the task to teach and transform these people um, to, to tax paying Spanish citizens um, and the idea of creating a reliable like kind of labor class system um, was very difficult for for these people and oftentimes children that are on my on my program or doing a program for them they'll often ask me well why would the Native Americans want to join a system that made them change everything about their lives why would they do that and um, that's a pretty complex answer because there's probably lots of different answers. One thing is technology. The Spanish offered so many different items they had never seen before. Um, before prior to the Spanish arrival, the Ahashman people were, were very, um, very, uh, you know, complex hunter-gatherers, um, but they didn't have items like metal knives, ammunition guns, um, things like that. I think that itself, technology, was a big factor in um, bringing people in. Uh, the priests uh, said in accounts that clothing and textile were very, they were very interested in that. They'd never seen that before. Um, they were also, the priests, one of the incentives of bringing people in was actually giving out glass beads. And at that point, the, the local um, bartering system was based on beads made out of shells and so forth. So when they were giving out beads, it was like giving out $100 bills in some respect. So they were interested in that. They were probably very much interested in the religion and the beautiful um, oil paintings that were brought in with colors they'd never seen before. And then also the animals, uh, the domesticated animals. Um, they had never seen a horse before, the Spanish arrival. And that completely transforms your idea of transportation at that point. I believe in Texas, they had the Native American tribes had horses long before the Spanish were coming. No, is that wrong? Okay, well, I, I'll take that back. So um, just, just that itself, I think, would have been very fascinating for, for the Ahashman people um, and the other tribes of, um, of uh, California. Another aspect of um, a reason for joining might have been a political move. If they were unhappy with the tribal system, uh, joining uh, the Spanish may have given them a higher um, status within the mission community. Another factor uh, was the amount of cattle that were bringing, bringing in. Um, in the early years, their, their, their herds were quite small, but 10 years in, uh, the mission had a population of about 25,000 head of cattle. And like I said, the Native Americans were hunters and gatherers. Um, their main, main crops were acorns and various seeds, and they used um, pyro, uh, pyro ecology to help bring back those, those wonderful different types of seeds and so forth. But with the cattle coming in, and now that's not even mentioning the sheep and the horses, they were eating their food supply. So maybe 10 years in, maybe not even 10 years in, their supply for food was being diminished. And so that may have uh, contributed to the, the Hashimans uh, or in other tribes coming into the missions. So Mission San Juan Capistrano, this is an image of what the mission would have looked like at its height around 1811. Um, so it was, 
it was very, pretty vast in the way that it, it looked. But um, for the California missions, um, the way that they kind of worked things out, uh, the majority of the Spanish troops that were there to protect them were at the forts. About 30 men would be at a fort. The local, uh, or the closest fort to Mission San Juan Capistrano is in San Diego. Um, so they were given about six soldiers to protect the mission and two Franciscan padres were basically in charge of everything, both the temporal and spiritual needs for the community. And if you think about that, um, especially as a, as a priest or as a padre, who may have not necessarily um, trained in creating a ranch, um, agriculture, et cetera, this was a huge task. And what I found out through various research, they actually brought some self-help books with them, like Agriculture for Dummies and Ranching for Dummies and things like that. And some, some missions actually, these, these men were pretty much clueless on, on where to basically put, drop these buildings and so forth. So in San Diego, they often, uh, they had uh, lots of trouble. They put it on a, two of an arid spot, they, then they stuck it in the middle of a floodplain and it got buried. So lots of problems for these Franciscan Padres. Um, but I think it must have been pretty lonely, especially uh, considering um, you've got one other guy who's on the same deal with you, the Franciscan Padre, and then we have six other guys that were the Spanish soldiers that may or may not have had similar values as you. It may have been a hindrance in some respects to the Native American population. So I mean, this was a huge, huge task um, to do this. Uh, so they were given very few tools and they were expected to do a lot with that. And um, in, in many respects, in the first few years were very difficult. They were given about five years to be self-sufficient. So coming in with a few tools and a few books, they were saying, you have five years and you should be self-sufficient. Um, food and everything else. So it was, it, it was a huge task and in many respects it took a while just to, to gain the trust of the local community and to bring them in and, and try to get them to be a part of this community because it was a big change in their lives. Um, at the height of the mission at this time around 1811 there was about a thousand people living at the mission which was a, quite a, a huge population and, and, and like I said they had been um, hunter-gatherers and they had lived in villages anywhere from 75 to 100 people so all of a sudden they were all congregated in one area um, which must have been uh, very different from prior prior life um, once they decided to come to the mission uh, the Spanish they obviously relocated them to, to the mission complex they were um, instructed in various uh, religious kind of education programs um, they were taught the Spanish language, they changed their clothing, their housing, um, and they were taught various new jobs including agriculture which they had no experience with whatsoever. Um, they were taught Spanish and Christian social customs and marriage practices and that kind of thing. And one of the, the main things I think would have been the most difficult is the regimenting of, of time. Um, their time every day, kind of like school kids in the classroom today, their bells would ring and tell them what to do and when to be, where to go, and all that good stuff. So um, usually around six or seven in the morning, the bells would ring and they'd go to mass. Afterwards, they had breakfast, and then they'd go to work until around noon where they had lunch and siesta until about two, and then they'd go back to work again and uh, go to evening prayers, and curfew is basically at eight. So this was kind of an everyday rigorous schedule that they had never experienced before. Um, and I think one of the, the more, I think more difficult thing, especially for the young women in the community was the Franciscans were very, um, very cautious about the, um, the chastity of the women in the community. So often they were segregated at the age of nine or so to be put in a women's dormitory. And so I think that must have been very difficult, especially for young families to say to your daughter, you can't, you can't be with here, us at night. I think that would have been very difficult um, to have to deal with. So um, a lot of changes were occurring, um, yet, yet these, these Ahashima people, the people of, of our mission, were incredibly accomplished um, in a short a period of time, learning different crafts and skills, like blacksmithing. We were one of the first missions to actually have furnaces to smelt our own iron, and that whole process is incredible. Um, they were building adobe structures, and later uh, the Great Stone Church 
which is one of three mission um, churches made out of stone in all of California. So just hand chiseling stones that weighed up to a thousand pounds and dragging them from two miles away to build this by hand is incredible amount of work, but um, just the designing and accomplishing something so amazing is quite an accomplishment for the community. Um, they also developed a, a very complex agricultural aqueduct system that uh, basically spanned miles, damming water and everything else. So they were incredibly accomplished in what they were doing. Unfortunately, um, with missions and congregating the community also led to um, uh, population. Uh, here, here's the Great Stone Church room before I get to that. Um, it was a very beautiful, large church. Uh, unfortunately, this is what it looks like today. Does anybody have any guesses of why it's in ruins? Earthquake. Somebody said it. Yeah. In 1812, there was about a 7.0 earthquake that um, caused its collapse. Um, it's one of the kind of the most tragic things that probably happened to the mission community. Forty people were at the early morning mass. The 101st anniversary just happened on December 8th. So December 8th, 1812, 40 people were in the early morning mass, and uh, the earthquake started. And according to the priests' um, written records, the bell tower collapsed on top of the church. That caused the, the door to be blocked, and 40 people were buried alive under the rubble. Um, the, the priest was, luckily, he was at the front, which is kind of where the dome is, is here today, back here, where the altar is. He managed to get out the sacristy door here. And, and this, is the, this room here is kind of behind that area, and the dome are the only things remaining of the church. The church took nine years to build. In a matter of minutes, it was completely a pile of stone. In ruins. It took them over a month to get all the bodies out of the rubble and have the people buried. So um, I can't imagine, first of all, something taking nine years to build, but then to watch everything be gone and your family members die in the accident must have been horrific. They never tried to rebuild the church and it's always stood in ruins since and kind of is more or less a memorial to, to the people who lost their lives and to the incredible amount of work that went into it. So like I said, we've got disasters, like I mentioned in the Great Stone Church ruins, um, but also disease um, proved to be one of the biggest problems, I think probably at any mission. The Europeans introduced a lot of new diseases they weren't, they didn't have any immunity to. Um, and at the worst, um, from, our, from our death <laughs> registers, um, each priest kept detailed records of baptisms, marriages, and burials. And in our burial records, um, the worst year wasn't 1812, which had the earthquake, 40 people. It was 1806 during a measles outbreak. 20% of the mission population died that year. Can you imagine? Almost one out of four people um, lost their lives. I can't imagine what that might have done to the community as well. So disease was a, a huge problem and um, I think the statistic was, like I said, 310,000 people lived in California prior to the Spanish arrival, and by, I think, 1850, it was 70,000. That's what disease did. Uh, the California missions um, were not secularized, like some of the other missions in Texas and New Mexico, and et cetera. Um, they, were, they were secularized with the uh, Mexico winning its independence with Spain. Uh, Mexico realized, okay, we have all these Spanish missions and these Spanish Franciscans running a huge portion of California, but we don't want to have anything to do with Spain. So that's kind of a you know, conflict of interest. So what are we going to do? Well, it took them about, oh, 12 years to decide what to do, um, and they decided to secularize them. Um, but uh, the idea initially was to give the land to the Native American population after it was secularized and they would have the land to farm, et cetera. But that's not what ended up happening. Um, the local, uh, I guess the Spanish people who had come in as craftsmen, as military, et cetera, they really wanted the land. And so what ended up happening was, which, which is Orange County today, it was carved out to wealthy landowners in the area. And these Native American people that were of the mission um, some of them did receive a portion of land, but were often swindled out of it. 
Um, other people decided to go to the local pueblos of Los Angeles and San Diego and seek work there. And the majority decided to work for these wealthy landowners. Um, so they were doing a lot of the same jobs they would have done at the mission. Um, for instance, being vaqueros or working weaving cloth, making food for the community of, of the ranchos. Um, but they kind of became absorbed into that system. Um, and in fact, at one, at, in 1845, um, P.O. Pigo, who was the governor at the time, um, actually realized, oh my gosh, the, the California, we don't have a lot of money in, in our government funding, so let's actually sell the mission buildings themselves. So he sold the mission, which was uh, decided, uh, you know, people came in and, and looked at all the items that belonged to the mission. They said, it's worth $54,000. But Pio Pico sold it to his brother-in-law, brother-in-law John Forster, for seven hundred and ten dollars. So you know, less than a laptop costs today. Um, and so he became the owner, uh, the private owner of the mission property. Um, and during that time, um, he used what was was used as the Padres quarters, um, as his personal living room, and et cetera. Um, Sarah Chapel at that time, um, although he used primarily for the community, um, became very much in, 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 a, in a horrible ruined state um, and at one point was used to store barley. So it was kind of a sad time in the mission's history. Um, but eventually it was returned to the Catholic Church in 1865. Um, that's about, let's see, 15 years after California got its statehood. Uh, there was a bishop in California who had seen what Pio Pico had done by auctioning off these mission lands, and he said, hey, that belongs to the Catholic Church. That's not okay. So they began petitioning the U.S. government, and finally they, they won um, the, the kind of this land struggle. And just two or three weeks before President Lincoln was assassinated, he signed the patent of title returning um, the mission San Juan Capistrano back to, to the Catholic Church. And at that point... Um, the mission had uh, irregularly had a parish priest come in. They, living in San Juan Capistrano at that time wasn't um, probably the most amazing job. You're kind of in the boonies of the, of the Wild West kind of thing. One of the, the parish priests was so scared um, because of the kind of notorious people who lived in town, he actually built a second story with the ladder he pulled up at night. Mm -hmm. And he kept the silver and stuff up there with him. Um, it was also the time in these, uh, I guess, 20 or so years after the missionaries returned, many of the buildings um, really began to fall into ruin, especially Sarah Chapel, which is kind of our more of our famous um, buildings uh, at the mission. Um, and here's a picture of what it looked like um, in 18, I think that's about 1880. Um, and when I show you a picture of what it looks like today, you're going to be kind of shocked. But the, the roofs are cl collapsing in. Um, the, the north and south wings, which would have been here, um, were completely a pile of mud. No one protected the roofs, which obviously you, knew it, you need if you have an adobe building, etc. So it really fell into to ruin. And um, it wasn't until the 1880s, 1890s that the missions began um, looking uh, or rather, people began looking at them as something that they needed to repair or restore. And it was at this time that um, Charles Lummis, you probably don't recognize his name, but he was friends with Theodore Roosevelt, went to Harvard. Um, he was known for um, a, a magazine he wrote, it was called Out West Magazine. He began noticing these beautiful Spanish, more or less, ruins. And he decided, we need to do something about it. So you got the local um, people in Los Angeles, architects, more of the affluent people to get together, start donating funds and helping restore these missions. And that's really what he began to do. And Mission San Juan Capistrano benefited from that, that the whole process started in 1895. But it wasn't until 1910 that things began to, to, to change. It was this time that um, missions in California be, kind of became romanticized and people came to take pictures with their, their giant, uh, you know, their, maybe their Model T Ford in front of these ruins, that kind of thing. Um, missions were kind of used as advertisement to people to coming out west. Um, it was also this time that uh, uh, pulp fiction stories were being written about the missions like Zorro, the Curse of Capistrano, as where Zorro came out of, um, is actually about, about our mission. 
So it was this time people began recognizing, hey, we've got this beautiful past that we need to help restore. And um, Father O'Sullivan, he came in 1910, and he actually said that his first night, he slept in the middle of the courtyard, which was just grass and, and so forth. He pitched a tent out there, and, and he slept, because he said all the bugs and stuff were biting him inside the rooms, and even a coyote came in one night. So he, he slept in the courtyard, and he decided um, he was going to spend the rest of his life trying to help protect the mission. He'd just been recently diagnosed with tuberculosis. The doctor had given him a year to live, but this man, who was going to die, decided that he was going to help this place. And the, the, the crazy story is um, he, I think it must have been uh, God or, or, or something divine that happened that let him keep living. So he ended up living at the mission for about 22 years and completely transformed the place. Um, he was the man who um, built the beautiful gardens that are now in our courtyard. Um, he helped restore Sarah Chapel, which dates back to 1782. Uh, it's the only remaining church in which Father Sarah had given Mass that still is in existence. Um, he, he brought the local community together and wrote a few books about it, and he's most famous for one thing, starting the Swallows legend. So if you know anything about Mission San Juan Capistrano, it's probably the song by Leon René, When the Swallows Come Back to Capistrano. Has anybody heard that song? Okay, well, it's the same guy who wrote Rock and, Rock and Robin, so I think he might have had a thing for birds, but... Um, <laughs> Father O'Sullivan noticed that th these birds um, were basically forming their, their mud nests in the ruins of the Great Stone Church, and he kind of gave notice to them. And, and in one of his books, it's called Capistrano Nights, which is about the stories of the town, he included one about the birds. And, he, and the story goes that um, a priest was walking down the street, the priest probably, Father O'Sullivan, um, noticed that a hotel keeper who's just down the street was knocking off these mud nests, and he asked him, well, why are you doing this? And the hotel keeper responded, well, these birds are terrible. They're just making a mess. There's poo everywhere. It's awful. I'm, I just I won't have anything to do with them. So the priest there on the spot said, Swallows, you are welcome to come to the mission and make this place your home. You are always welcome. And so ever since then, they've been returning to the mission on March 19th, which happens to be a Catholic feast day, St. Joseph's Day, but also Father O'Sullivan's birthday. Well, that story kind of um, helps provide kind of a, a, a community celebration. Father Sullivan um, built a school, which is now the North Wing building, um, in the 1920s, and he got the, the Catholic school children to start doing pageantry and getting the local community excited about this event. And even NBC Radio started coming in and recording the children singing and so forth. And in 1939, one of those broadcasts is when Leon Rene heard about this event and then wrote the song. Now that song was probably the most important thing that's ever happened to Mission San Juan Capistrano, and the reason being is it brought the mission to the national level. People wanted to know more about it. People wanted to come and visit to see the swallows. It be kind of really became a romanticized spot in the public's mind. But these little birds are our avian ambassadors because it gets people interested in something that's beautiful and historic and has a long legacy of the history of California and gets people excited about it. So I think that the number one reason we might be the most visited mission in California, I think Santa Barbara's probably close second, um, is because of these birds. We get about 300,000 people annually coming to visit the mission and the highest mm -hmm. month of visitation is March. So go figure. Um, so there's, there's, that's the, uh, the early record by Pat Boone. There's lots of versions. Um, Pat Boone, The Ink Spots, and I think Gene Autry all have a cover of the song. So um, this is just kind of to kind of see the transformation during Father O'Sullivan's time. This is approximately 1895 with the horse and carriage and so forth. And this is 19, circa 1930. You can kind of see all of the vegetation and so forth being planted. The mission um, also became a, a tourist location. The railroad came through town, so lots of people would stop by. Father O'Sullivan put a statue of Father Junipero Serra at the entrance, and he also started charging admission. He was the first person to do that in 1915. Um, back then it cost a dime, which was more than what a movie cost at that time. Today, admission costs $9 less than a movie. I always tell that to people. 
But um, again, this is what kind of the mission looked like in uh, the 1930s, and this is what it looks like today. But um, the mission, mission is, is a beautiful place, and it's gone through lots of different eras of history from its early Spanish beginnings, um, and then even into the 20th century, and the kind of this beautiful pop culture-y um, legacy, more or less, with the swallows. But it's a beautiful and interesting place, and I have a pleasure of working, working here and helping educate our, our children, our next generation, about the mission, and how it's important that we know our past so that we can protect it for future generations. And I know that's how you feel about some of the historic sites that are here in El Paso and, and uh, west portions of Texas and New Mexico. Um, it's, it's a beautiful legacy and it's a beautiful um, thing that, that I have the opportunity to express that to people who are interested. So that kind of concludes my lecture. Does anyone have any questions uh, specifically? Yes? Exactly where is Capistrano in relation to California? I ought to have that map, but I can show you, um, let's see. It's in Orange County, California. So um, it's roughly right about here on the map. San Diego is right here. And then this would be where San Juan Capistrano is. So it's between San Diego and LA? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, Los Angeles is about here. Yeah, Del Mar is just south. It's closer to uh, Oceanside. There's a 21 missions in the state of California. The first was established in 1769, and then the last one was 1823, which is actually after the Mexican won its independence from Spain. So and that was in Sonoma. That was way up here. Yeah? You mentioned that the fourth graders come every year. Mm -hmm. Then that would be public school also? Yes, in fourth grade, uh, state curriculum is uh, based on, the, the social studies curriculum is based on California history. So they're learning um, from the Native American early uh, history up until, um, it's usually, I, I, I want to say it's early 20th century California history. So, yeah. about going on a field trip <laughs> or just making a fuss. Well, oftentimes, um, I mean, I even in, in television shows, I just found out recently, there's a show on NBC called Parenthood and it takes place in California, the, the, this family or what have you. But in, in, the, in the show, it, has, it shows how the kids are working on a mission model. It's very, very common. Um, where in fourth grade, they'd make a mission model and do a, a report about the mission. So almost every fourth grade, if you grow up in California, that's what you'll be doing in, in fourth grade. I actually did my mission report on Mission San Juan Capistrano, now I work here. So go figure. And it's, it's kind of a funny thing. I actually have pictures of me in Yosemite too, and I ended up working there. So I don't know. I don't know. Where am I going to go next? <laughs> El Paso. El Paso. I don't know. Um, as a kid, I loved going to historic sites. Um, my dad gave us the opportunity to go back east, so we went to Civil War battlefields and go to the Smithsonian's and things like that. And I think um, my sisters were having a terrible time, but I was having a great time. So go figure. Do you, do, uh, offhand, I'm not sure. Uh, are most of the missions under the same architecture? Yeah, for the most part, um, the missions were in this quadrangle shape. Not all the missions had stone structures. Like I said, I think there's only three stone churches in the entire state that were made. And part of that is because of quarries available to them. Most of them are in the adobe style, um, although some of them were much bigger than other churches, depending on the Native American population that was nearby. Um, not all of them had a population of a thousand or so. Some of them were drastically lower in number. So I think it just kind of depended on the labor force too available to create something as grand as the Great Stone Church. And that's actually how we got our nickname the jewel of the missions. Almost every California mission, each mission has its own nickname, whether it's the queen of the missions or the jewel. We're called the jewel. It's because of the Great Stone Church and it's, its beauty. So, yeah. So most of them were in that design. Restoration sort of complete. Um, that's kind of awkward. No, that, on on on. Right. It's a continual process. You're right. Now, the original buildings that we have of the mission is the soldier's barracks, which is here, the south wing quarters, which is the... Um, where the Padres made their quarters, so their living space, their offices, and so forth. Um, the Sala building, which was used as a Sala um, during the Forster era, 
um, uh, when, they, when they, they sold it off to a private landowner. Sarah Chapel's here. So these buildings date to the 1780s. Um, the West Wing was lost in the 1850s or so. It's the same with the North Wing. It was rebuilt during uh, O'Sullivan's era. This became the children's school in the 1920s. And it's actually um, in the 20s, they uh, had visiting nuns teaching the school. So their, their uh, convento or so was about here, and now it's administration offices. So my office is actually in an old nun's quarters. I have a bathroom attached, it's pretty great. So, um, so yeah, and then the West Wing was rebuilt in the 1970s as museum rooms. And then we have obviously the, the ruins of the Great Stone Church. Today, the mission is surrounded by a wall and the, the whole town's kind of grew up around it. So it's very urban. Um, there's other missions in California that uh, don't have a town nearby. One is, I think it's San Antonio, which is um, south of, of San Francisco, that was actually a, a military base, um, was formed right, right around it. So it's very open and kind of gives you a sense of what it might have looked like during that time. Form the Presidio, which is a military well, yeah, but that, that didn't actually, wasn't formed until like the 1890s. So it was a U.S. Um, military base. Yeah. Yes? Is it also a parish? Yeah, it's an active uh, parish. Um, it's kind of complicated. The Diocese of Orange owns the property, but the mission is run by a nonprofit organization. Now, not all the missions that's true of in California. Two are run by the state park system. Um, it was given to the state parks. And then the majority are active parishes that the, that the Catholic Church runs and operates. So in, in many respects, I think um, our preservation efforts are doing much better because we are a nonprofit and we um, have uh, wonderful benefactors who donate to preservation pro projects, but are, we also charge admission, which is not all the missions do, but it certainly helps keep our operating um, going. Just keeping the lights on and the security there and uh, staff people costs a good portion of money. So that's what our mission goes towards. Yes? Right. Um, in the mission period, um, the courtyard was kind of the heart of things. Um, we know that um, in the West Wing was mostly where uh, the blacksmithing was happening. We had uh, weaving and textile production um, in the North Corridor. Um, there's, we have archaeological evidence of tanning vats out in this area. Um, and the Catalan furnaces were here. Tallow production was happening out just outside the West Gate area. Um, this image shows that um, the vineyards would have been adjacent to this area. There was large vegetable gardens out, um, I guess that would be east of the mission and south of the mission. And all of Orange County, um, which is quite large, so even where Disneyland is, belonged, was the property of the mission. And that's where all the cattle would have been grazing and roaming. So that's that, that was enough room for the 25,000 head of cattle that they had, so. About how many acres did they I don't know how many acres are in Orange County, but um, this is a good section of the state, and I, I think the, this, uh, this whole area, oh, excuse me, so about from here is all of Orange County today. So it's a good significant amount of land. So when did, you know, when did they start spinning off the property that condensed the town? Was that after the Civil War? Or? Well, after the mission was returned to the Catholic Church, a it was a significantly smaller what they retained. Okay. So um, the actual property that the, the buildings are, uh, sit on is what they were returned. So it wasn't the acreage it once was. Um, is pretty much just where the buildings were located. And the town had really developed around it even early 20th century. So the, the local town was, is in this area. Um, so there's lots of adobes and um, businesses and hotels and things like that. And, and that's mostly because of the mission, early 20th century. Um, it, it, was a, it was probably a nice jaunt on the railroad to come and visit the town. It, it wasn't anything grand or anything like that, but um, I think it would be fun. And in early 20th century, even in the 1920s, there's advertisements of um, 
scenic drives in the early you know, Model T Fords and those kinds of vehicles. It was a, a great outing to go and see these, these missions. So oftentimes you'll see them in advertisements of that time period. Come out to the railroad and they have pictures of missions um, and things like that. Even on the orange, the citrus industry that was developing in Los Angeles and Orange County at the time featured um, the mission. This is San Gabriel mission in the background. So that romanticized past to come and visit and experience California. So do you Well, that's interesting. We have the original wine vats. They're, they're, they're not like the one that's in the, in the second floor exhibit. They're actually brick-lined, um, large holes in the ground, more or less. But um, we don't usually do grape stomping. However, uh, when we had a living history program going on about five years ago when it was very active, we do have um, a, a vine going on a kind of a pergola um, that has splices of various um, grapes that date back to the 1850s or so, but um, they used to do a grape stomping where they would take off the, the grapes and do that and kind of do a reenactment. Um, we, we haven't been done that for quite a few years. Um, as for blacksmithing, we do have a blacksmithing uh, station that's outside. It's not in the West Wing building. It's now museums, but I've got, I got to go to blacksmithing school in, in San Diego, and it was really fun. So I do a branding program with children where they can brand leather hides and their kind of necklaces, which are pretty cool. And um, when I have a chance, I'll do demonstration on how to make a nail and that kind of thing. But I, they keep me pretty busy, so I don't get to do that as much as I would like. Yeah, but blacksmithing is, I think, one of the most interesting things about um, early colonial craftsmen and, and how amazing the Native American people were learning the skills at a, a very fast rate. These were very smart people. I mean, f from not knowing how to use something at all, to creating the Great Stone Church and making these beautiful buildings and what, et cetera, is a, just an incredible amount of knowledge that they gain pretty quickly. Yeah? Is the, the statue of the Amazon Queen, is it an old? This, an old I believe, um, um, no, this, this picture here, um, I want to say it's in Catalina Island, which is just outside of Los Angeles. They, they have that kind of depiction of what she looked like. Um, actually, at Disneyland, they had a ride, which I don't think is in existence anymore, that actually featured her in it. So she's kind of this mythical figure. And I was kind of reading a little bit about it, you know, why would the author pick um, Cala, Calafia as a name? And I think it's from the word caliph, which is an Islamic leader. Um, and what I thought was interesting is um, there's a very popular TV show called Game of Thrones. I don't know if you've heard of this on HBO, but one of uh, the very strong female leads, her name is Khaleesi, which probably also is derived from the same word. So it's kind of fun. Any more questions? Yes. Why was the mission located where it was? Uh, like many missions, they, they located it for three main reasons. First reason is their Native American population. Second reason, there was a water source for agriculture. There's three nearby creeks. And the third reason is, did they have enough fuel resources? So um, for instance, uh, wood for um, various projects, uh, like baking charcoal for things like baking, using kilns for red bricks, red roof tiles, um, just for various purposes in cooking and so forth. So those are kind of the main three reasons why they chose that site. Um, they also were trying to create a chain of missions. Um, the two main hubs were Monterey and San Diego, and then later Santa Barbara. And so they were trying to make a chain so it's about a day's journey between each mission, so it would make the journey up the coast a little bit easier. Was the transportation route along the Camino Real? They, we do have an El Camino Real like Texas does, and it was up through the chain of missions. Um, and there's, it's really interesting in the early 20th century, I think around 1905, there was a, a group of women who really wanted to make that bit of history known. So there was a project where they, they made these bell markers. So if you're in nearby in Mission, et cetera, you'll often see the El Camino Real bells that line the, the road up to each mission. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities.